I was listening to LBC on the way to my first event this morning, and it was all about the election. It was, it was politics as it always is at that time of the morning, and it was all very negative. Every single person who called in, without exception, you could hear them spitting tax. It was a kind of hiss with each new call. But if you look at the data over the last few decades, it more than backs up that sense that we all have. So voter disengagement is, has been captured. Uh, uh, membership of political parties is at an all-time low. Um, there are more members now of 38 Degrees, a, campaign, a campaigning website, than there are all the mainstream political parties put together. Between 1945 and 1997, the average turnout in elections was over 75%. But since then, the average has been 60%, and it's a downward trend. So you have the occasional blip. You have the Scottish referendum, which agitate and, agitated and excited a great many people, but the trend is still nevertheless downwards. And politicians are also obviously aware of this. And they tend to ignore the issue in between elections, but as you get closer to an election, it's something that people start talking about. How do you engage more people? What's the cause of this? And the impulse of politicians, certainly the mainstream parties, is to either blame apathy on the most recent scandal, uh, and the big scandal, I suppose. There have been lots of little scandals, but the big scandal that's fresh in all of our memories is the expensive scandals. The, the other impulse for those people who don't reach out for the most recent scandal is to blame it on, on you, affected on apathy. Um, and there are so many reasons to, to disagree with this analysis that blames voter disengagement on apathy. You only have to look at what happened around the time of the Iraq war. I think, you know, that we dispute the figures, but something around 2 million people marched in the streets of London against that intervention. Or look at the ban on hunting. You had 550, 600,000 people coming into London from elsewhere to campaign against it. You've got, I'm reliably told, over 5.5 million people who are active members of conservation or environmental organizations. And that's just one sector of interest. There are many, many other sectors as well. So I don't think it is plausible any longer to blame disengagement on political apathy. And I remember at the last election, when this issue customarily raised its head, and we had politicians coming forward with a, a range of ideas about how to deal with this, all of them based on this idea that the cause is apathy. So you had people talking about rewarding people for voting for the first time. There was even a suggestion that people should be given free iPods. Uh, you, know, with young, you know, young voters in particular, and elderly people would be given warm buns uh, as a reward for <laughs> telling That was a, an idea, I think, Hazel Blears put, put, put the idea forward. Um, and other people saying, you know, it's not enough, you've got to make it mandatory. Look at the Australian uh, mechanism, you've got to fine people if they don't turn up to vote. But it all misses the point, in my view. And I think the basic problem with our political system is that even while the world has changed beyond all recognition, and in an incredibly short period of time, politics has stubbornly stood still. There have been no fundamental reforms of any sort nothing to speak of, at least, over the last five, ten years. But we have a situation today where, unlike even 15 years ago, if you wanted information about your MP, you'd either have to wait for the scandal in the newspaper, or you'd have to wait months for your transcript of Hansard, and that would put you in the 1% of 1% of 1% of people who actually bother to read Hansard, or you would wait for that quarterly newsletter that your MP would send you, in which there would be all the information that your MP wants you to read. Nowadays, your MP might be telling you one thing in your constituency, but when it comes to debating the issue and then voting later on on that same issue, you can know within seconds what they've said, how they've said it, how they voted at the end of it, and you can decide, have they voted and behaved in a way that they said they would when I was casting my vote at the last election? We have a population that not only has access to information on a scale that we've never seen before, and that isn't an exaggeration, it is extraordinary. And still things continue to change very, very quickly. You've also got a better informed, better educated, and less deferential population, I would say, than we have ever had before as well. But despite that shift, politics has simply stood still. It is as remote today as it has ever been. And that is true at every level of government. You know who represents you in your patch, and yes, you can boot them out but only once every 1,500 days. And in between those two general elections, you have no alternative but to just accept whatever it is that your representative does. And it, it is not an exaggeration to say that in those 1,500 days, an MP is completely untouchable. I could, you know, if I, let's say I'm elected again on May the 7th in Richmond Park and North Kingston, I could hold a press conference on May the 8th, and I could announce that I'm not actually a conservative after all. I'm going to join the British National Party, even though there isn't even a candidate for the British National Party in my patch. There's nothing my constituents could do for the next five years other than be embarrassed about the fact that they're the only <laughs> people in the country represented by the British 
Kurdish National Party, or I could just go off on holiday for five years. I wouldn't have broken a single rule. I could go off to Barbados, and I could leave my constituency work to my uh, uh, trusty caseworker, and I could just simply not go to Parliament at all. I wouldn't have broken a single rule. The code of conduct that I signed, assuming it's the same code of conduct that I'll be signing next time, doesn't prohibit any of these behaviors. I can do more or less whatever I want. And you may say those are extreme, but it's not extreme to imagine an MP making a whole range of promises on really important issues, issues that matter absolutely to the people who are electing him or her, and then breaking all those promises. That happens all the time. But there is no comeback. I could stand specifically on an issue of fighting off the threat of Heathrow expansion. It's a big issue in my patch. But there's nothing to stop me after the election taking a non-executive position with Heathrow and, and becoming one of the greatest cheerleaders. There's nothing my constituents could do about it. And I would say, therefore, that it's unsurprising if there is a sense among a great many people that it doesn't really matter if and how they vote, that very little is going to change. And, and people are, as a consequence, pulling away from the political process, not pulling away from an interest in politics, but pulling away from the way we do politics. And my heart sinks when I hear people, including celebrity Russell Brand, for example, talking about boycotting elections, walking away from democracy, waiting for it to somehow magically improve. Because I can't think of a single example anywhere in the world of people walking away from democracy to something better. My view is that if it's broken, you don't boycott it, you get involved, you get your teeth into it, and you try and knock it back into shape.